I went to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, when you got there, what happened? I mean, when I got to the airport, my cafe, that's the man that I was going to work with. But when I was in Ghana, my agent told me I was going to work at a supermarket. Mm. So when I get to the airport, a certain man came and took me to the house and told me that I'm going to do a house up. Oh, I said, oh, no problem. It's because of money that I came, so I'll do it. And so I was there when one of his sons came in that he went to sleep with me. I said, no, we, in our country, we don't do that there. When you, when you know that his parents are not around before to be coming to my room, so at our place, we are not doing shit. You want out. So do the same so things that the harassment and the more treatment that I was going through. And then I said, then I'll go to, I'll run so that I'll go and look for another job. I thought maybe there is like Ghana that if you go around, you see. So I'll go around the whole town. There was no help. Only men that I've been seeing. So there was a certain man with, in his private car and he stopped me, he said, where am I going? I said, oh, this one, this, that, my mom is doing too. I'm working with her, she's not giving me food. I was even sleeping, uh, sleeping on bed floor without seeing food. So I'm, I'm very sick. He said, then I should come so that when people like this one are with there, kind of way they are giving to them, they'll pay them, well. they'll give them food, so I should come. So that he sent me to some people, so I'll go and work with that. So okay. So I follow him and he put him into a certain room. He said, he's going to call the person that I'm going to work with him again. So I was there and he came with three men, including me. And he said, I should pull my crew. And I said, no, why? Why should I pull? But you say you are, come to, um, you are going to call someone that I'm going to work with. So I said, I should pull myself. So no, I should pull. So they, they, they move a knife from them. If I should not move my crew, they will kill me. So I was there. I said, no. So one of them forced me to move all my crew. And all the four men slept with me. In the room? In the room. The guy you didn't know from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So what happened? After that, then they put me. Uh, all of the treatment, they, they, after they finished, they all went. And the one who took me then, he was going. Then I was following. He said, following you, kill me. I should go back. I should go. So I was following him a bit. I, I don't know. All of a sudden, I've not seen him again. So I started swimming the town again. So I don't know where to go. I was swimming and then. Something came into my mind that I should stop a taxi and go to the airport. So I was at the airport and a certain came. I went there, going to some hours. I was sitting and a certain man came to me and said, ah, I've been watching you. Why? You came here since you are still here. I said, yes, this is so and so. So I need help. So he took me to the Africans. That was Ethiopians. So I was there. They are, they are all taking their flight. I'm still there. And a certain Philippian cleaner was in the airport. She came and told me that I should come. There's a certain man here. If you go to some situation like this, they've been helping you, so I should come. And she took me to the police, uh, at the airport police. There was airport in the police. They took me there and they interrogated me. And he said then they took me to their central police station. So I was there too. I went and spent uh, one month there. So, and they do my things for the call. There was an embassy, Ghana embassy there. So they call them, and they take my picture, and they did my everything for me. They, they, they deport me. Yes. So when you got to Ghana, you realized you were pregnant? Yes. Well, I was severely sick, and I went to the hospital, and they said I was pregnant. They did me three tests HIV test, and the pregnant test, and the other test, and they said I'm pregnant. Yeah. I What happened? What is your story? Uh, my story. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I think I was I was six years. Yeah. So I, one day I came back from school and then, you know my mom's dad is this I would say philanthropist who goes to bring all the relatives back at home in the village to come stay with him. And then uh, then my mom my parents were not staying in Ashaiman. They were at Spinters, Spinters and I. The school that I was attending was in Ashaiman, so I had to stay with my grandparents. And when I was a little girl, I was a very bad girl. Mm. Like if the you were a naughty girl, you weren't a bad girl. You're okay. Six years. <laughs> okay, I was a naughty girl. Mm -hmm. Like if the meat is missing from the soup, it's Irene. Go and ask Irene. She did it. Mm -hmm. If you sent Irene to buy bread, you know when the slices, mm -hmm. made it to be free, like yeah. and eat some before I come back. So everyone knew I was a naughty girl. So like I came back and then this, I don't know whether to call him an uncle or a distant relative. He was also staying with us. 
So one day I came back from school. And because of that, I was always scared because me, the day behind your bum, right? I, I always, always, always been bitten. Like every day, I've done. Even if it's not me, since Irene does everything, if right. something goes wrong, go and beat Irene. Right. So I came back from school, and then he came into the room. And then I was like, "Hey, what have I done this time?" And then he he was like, "Howdy, the good year. Take off your panties." I'm like, "Okay." And then he did whatever he wanted to do. And then he he was like, don't tell anyone, Magabina Madoko. The first time, I was really, really scared. And then even after that, he sent me to go and buy something. I came back, and because of that, I was scared. That day, I didn't take some of the thing. Yeah. And then I gave it back to him. See, I, I, I was always scared because even if he fabricates a story about me, everyone is going to believe it because I really So you, you were sexist, but you knew that it was wrong. Or you didn't know? I don't know. I don't know what it was. But I, but I knew there was something wrong with it. Like, even though you, you were not really sure, but you knew this is not okay. He's like, tell no one. Mm. So I think, and it wasn't once. Mm. It wasn't twice. So maybe my mom, my mom came around and then I told her. And even that I was scared. Because maybe they would say I was lying. Mm. But God bless her. Mm. She... Even though she, I couldn't talk to anyone about it, but I think I told an auntie, and she was like, "You didn't, you didn't want to So I can't say anything. You yeah, keep anymore. quiet. Like, You're lying. You didn't wow. say yeah. So and then so when my mom came, I told my mom, and then it, and it has been a long time. Like it's been it, it's been happening for a long time. So like and even if something is to be done, I have no evidence. Mm. So she was like, "You don't worry." So later she took me out of the place. But actually, I didn't realize what it was till I was like 13. And then, at 13 I was in GSS3, I think so. So I was talking to a lot of people and then my friends were talking about their boyfriends and a lot of things. Then they started to, and then this, I think it was an organization came to my school and they were like, they were looking for virgins to do something with. Mm. So, and I was like, yeah, I haven't had sex before. So I was ready to, do it and then no something was like no if i sit down and think something had gone wrong with you somewhere so that was where i realized the impact mm. but with that i couldn't talk about it mm. my mom did well by taking me out of that environment but who are you going to tell because even on from the onset they were like we are called you didn't you were a bad girl keep quiet so i couldn't talk about right. it and then i was it made me i was so shy mm. Then I was scared. I felt like I was a bad girl. Because um, around that time, a girl was also raped in that area. And people were like, hey, no, no, yeah, yeah. Wanko, wanka. So because everyone was like, it was her fault. fault. I felt like, so it was my fault I was raped. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I don't know whether it was rape or defilement or whatever. <laughs> because he didn't force me, but I had to obey. So and then but it wasn't your will. He he told you like, to do it just yeah. And every day when had I no will. you had no will. Yeah, you had no will. Every day when I come back from school, he comes to the room and oh. sometimes I'll come back from school. I remember I'll hide in the cupboard. Mm -hmm. They will come and look for me in the room. And yeah, so that was how it was. You know, every now and then things happen to us that shakes us off or out of our comfort zone and makes us break the norm and um, do something out of the, the ordinary. Quite recently, I had a young lady um, come to the studio. I, you know, I got to know of her through my uh, PE pal who um, told me about her and what she does and that she works with trafficked and abused, you know, um, children and the young people. When she came, I, I just thought we'd just do some 10 minutes and insert it in a program that we had quite recently with Dr. Ama Edwin on abuse. But when I started talking to her, when I got to talk to her, then I realized that I have a program. She has a story that must be heard, must be heard, and lessons that we need to learn from. I, I, I learned a lot. And trust me, since I met her, you know, I've changed a lot of things 
about myself and how I see people and how I interact people and how interact with people and how I accept people. Well, don't let me talk too much. Well, welcome to the standpoint. Let me say thank you to GTP. Today I've combined two different fabrics, you know, and uh, this is new style. This is um, uh, Safwa, so we put it together and beautifully done so by Ophelia Crossland Designs. Dora, you always hook me up. Thank you so much for that. I'm so, so, so grateful to you. My hair is by Inshilo, and then, of course, my beads by Sun Beads and more. Sun Beads and more. And then my makeup products by Papa Cosmetics applied by makeup and more. This is a program we recorded some time ago and I have to play back to you and you need to watch it. We'll be back. I'm a beneficiary of the Girl in Need Foundation. Some time ago, there was no hope for me to go to school, but through the Girl in Need Foundation, I was able to complete my secondary education. I quite remember when we completed JHS, things became very, very tough. But with the help of God and the help of this foundation, which is the Girl in Need Child Foundation, now we are who we are today. And this foundation are really, has really, really helped me. So I'm pleading with you that you help with any amount you have. Please give something out, donate at least one city for a girl. It will change one one's life. Remember, your one city can touch a life out there, can make impact in the life of somebody. So I've been joined by Juanita Headley. She's a New York attorney and chief executive officer and founder of Changing Cases. Juanita, welcome to The Standpoint. Thank you for having me. Good to have you here. So tell me about Changing Cases. Changing Cases, it's a grassroots organization that I set up in 2014. My desire is to see the eradication of homelessness and sexual exploitation. Mm. With the organization, what I do is educate and empower people around the world on the issue of human trafficking, child abuse, and exploitation. Mm. And I also help to empower those who do not have very much. So I teach those in the Philippines and India baking skills, teach them English, so that way they're able to get a better opportunity when they grow older. Mm. So are you based in the Philippines or India? Both Philippines, India, and also Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, but why did you decide to take this path? Because you are a New York attorney. That's right. So you are, that's like your main profession. Yes. But this is changing <laughs> cases, your passion, I believe. Yeah, I'm a New York attorney. I have been a practicing attorney for four years okay. in the United States. But because I am a British citizen, my parents are from Jamaica, I don't have a green card or a work permit or a visa. So I provide free legal advice to those who are indigent, immigrants, those who are homeless and cannot afford a lawyer. Yeah. For the last four years, I've been providing free legal advice for individuals, but it doesn't pay the bills. Okay. And so for me, staying in the US and not getting paid, it's very expensive, mm. it's very challenging. I much rather go to the other side of the world, spend time in the orphanages, spend time volunteering, because it's cheaper to live there, number mm. one, and then number two, when I'm in an orphanage, they provide free accommodation and free food. Okay. And then because of my own experience of being sexually abused as a child, mm -hmm. I really have a desire to protect and safeguard other children mm -hmm. from the experience that I went through. Okay. So you said you've been sexually abused as a child yourself. That's correct. And how did that affect you? For me personally, as a born-again Christian, I believe that I'm healed in Jesus' name. Amen. But as a young person and even as an adult, I have seen that there are still certain things I struggle with. So I've had insomnia in the past. I used to wet the bed, used to have anger issues, low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. These are some of the signs and identifiers in mm -hmm. girls and boys, men and women who mm -hmm. were abused maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And although I believe I'm healed, there are times when I may not sleep very well, mm -hmm. which is the insomnia. And in my case, my first stepfather, my mother's remarried now, mm. my first stepfather who abused me sexually, 
he abused me during my sleep from the age of four to ten. So when your That's sleep what six is, years, correct. Continuous. When your sleep is interrupted, it kind of makes sense. You will suffer with insomnia. Mm. 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 And did you do you tell your mother about it? When I was a child, I tried to tell my grandfather and my aunt about what I was going through. I asked them the question, "Can you keep a secret?" which is actually the title of my new book that will be coming out. Okay. When I asked my grandfather and aunt, can you keep a secret? They said, it depends. And then they went on to explain. And as a result of that, it depends. I kept the abuse secret for years. However, I personally believe if you respond yes to the secret, the you child will. will disclose to you. Once they've disclosed and you tell them, I have to break your trust, and then you inform the authorities. A lot of people get concerned and say it's dishonest, it's lying. No, it's not. Because when you hear the secret, you keep it for about a minute mm. or maybe two. You listen to it and then you make a decision. Right. And I've met a lot of survivors and victims of sexual abuse, male and female, mm. even in Ghana. People in their 20s, 30s and 40s, some of whom have never disclosed the sexual abuse to anyone apart from me. Mm. Apart from me. And I found that interesting because a lot of us, when we're going through anything, whether it's abuse, whether it's something fantastic, we like to share with others. Yeah. So why is it that all of these victim survivors say nothing until they meet me? That means they can't confide in anybody. Don't trust. There's an issue of trust. Correct. But it's interesting that when I explain, when I present, can you keep a secret? When someone asks that question, you respond, yes. And then they may tell you, for example, daddy is eating my cookie, which is what a seven-year-old girl said. Because she used the word cookie, nobody had any idea that was her private parts. Mm. So can you keep a secret? Yes. She would say, daddy is eating my cookie, for example. Then you say, I have to break your trust. Then you inform the authorities. Mm. When I say this in a room full of 800, 700 individuals, they've heard that when I say to them, I can keep a secret, meaning yes, they know that I may eventually break that secret, but I'll tell them first. Yes. And interestingly, they still tell me their secrets, mm. even though they know that you'll break it. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. break it. But, yeah. but, but because they know there is a process. Acceptable. Yes, and they really want the help. And it's not that I run off behind closed doors and tell their secret. I discuss it with them first. Because I've met a lot of adults who struggle with this whole saying yes. Mm. And they don't want to do it. But for me, it's working. Mm. Because even though I may announce that to a room full of kids or adults, at the end, they tell me their secret. Which I find fascinating. <laughs> That's the issue of trust, isn't it? Yeah. And also, because I'm the stranger, I'm usually the foreigner, they trust that I'm not going to gossip with anybody Funny. because I don't know anyone. And so that's why they have the confidence to disclose to me. And then because I have been a victim, I'm now a survivor, I'm not going to judge them. I have children telling me about how they've had ancestral relationships, how they've abused their peers and their cousins. And some of the things they tell me, I don't approve of, but I don't judge them. Right. Some of them tell me they've had lesbian experiences. Some of the boys tell me they're addicted to pornography. And they give me details and try to shock me, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> Trust You've me. had it all. I have. <laughs> You've had it all, so it doesn't work. No. It, doesn't, it doesn't shake you at all. No. And even one young boy in church, at a seven-day Adventist church, at the end he came up to me and told me his secret. And then he started to detail the sexual activity play by play. I didn't need to know all that. And I stood at the front of the church, and I was like gulping deeply. I was so uncomfortable. But I just smiled well, and nodded. Not, not. <laughs> but would you say that your own experience too had made you have issues with trust? I don't think so. I think that I trust too much. And I say that because of my Christianity. When we're Christian, often we're very trusting and we meet each other. And then after service, we call each other brother and sister. And then we hug one another. I'm not paranoid. By the grace of God, I'm not paranoid. And I have a lot of male friends. Now, my personal opinion, non-lawyer, my personal opinion is that out of 100%, Personal opinion, non-lawyer talk here. Right. Ninety-nine percent of men have done something that was borderline pedophilic, or looked at a child pornography video, or had a thought. My belief: ninety-nine percent of men. And I say that because I hear so many stories of girls and boys being sexually abused by men or boys or males. So I believe around ninety-nine percent. I believe they're not Catholic because no. people keep bashing the Catholic That's Church. I believe they're people. 
But even though I think 99% of men are pedophiles. I like that. Hold on to that. Yes. People keep bashing the Catholic Church. Yes, yes. But they are people. Mm, it's not yes. the institution that is doing but it's the people in there. I agree. Who are doing that. Yes. Mm. I, I'm, I'm a strong believer of the word human being. For me personally, when we sit and call somebody a murderer, a rapist, or a pedophile, I don't feel we have any place to judge and point the finger. Because for me as a lawyer, I can say confidently that everybody in this building right here has committed a crime, and I believe the crime is probably theft. If any one of us in this building has ever taken something without consent, our mom's lipstick, dad's aftershave, mm. gone a CD, whatever, without consent, legally that's theft. Yeah. But of course we don't call ourselves that's thieves, do we? <laughs> because we didn't get caught. The point is, every single one of us has done something. It's like sin. Yes, you that's know, my everybody point. Everybody has sinned. Everyone you know, yet we, <laughs> we, we, you know, yes. uh, classify certain people as sinners, depending yes. on what they have done. Correct. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has committed a crime, which is probably theft. And in my opinion, every single male or female who is a pedophile is not from the Catholic Church because it's people. Being Catholic doesn't make you a pedophile. And I think when we say that and we have that kind of opinion, it's so wrong. Mm. But even though I believe 99% of men, not Catholics, men are pedophiles, I have so many male friends. Mm. And the sad reality is there is a high possibility that at least one of them has done something sexual with a child younger than him. Maybe one of my peers, when they were 12, they did something sexual with an 11-year-old. That's a crime. That's a crime. Yes. That's a crime. That's a crime. And I'm talking to Juanita Headley. New York attorney, chief executive officer and founder, changing cases. Water gives life. Water is life. Enjoy the pure, refreshing taste of awake, purified drinking water, which comes in a uniquely designed bottle with a lemon green tap. Water is your perfect way to stay hydrated. And remember, for every bottle you buy, an amount will be donated to the National COVID Thoracic Centre, Ghana. Awake Purified Drinking Water, one for life. For bulk purchase, contact I'm a beneficiary of the Girl in Need Foundation. Some time ago, there was no hope for me to go to school, but through the Girl in Need Foundation, I was able to complete my secondary education. I quite remember when we completed JHS, things became very, very tough. But with the help of God and the help of this foundation, which is the Girl in Need Child Foundation, now we are who we are today. And this foundation has really, has really, really helped me. So I'm pleading with you that you help with any amount you have. Please give something out. Donate at least one city for a girl. We'll change one one's life. Remember, your one city can touch a life out there, can make impact in the life of somebody. I'm sure now you are setting up shocked, right? Yeah, she's deep. She is quite deep. Well, let me say thank you to our supporters as well. Um, Casa Precon, uh, Royal Drinks, and Awake Purified Mineral Water. Thank you so much to them. Thank you to House of Foods, Auntie Vera. Hmm, what will I do without you? And Cake Technique, always hooking us up. We are so, so grateful to you all. You have cleaning services. You make sure our environment is always clean. And we are grateful to you as well. Of course, my beats. I keep saying more. It's sun beats and all. They do all. Sun beats and all. They do all. So we're so grateful to them. We'll be back to con continue this discussion. In these areas that you do the work that you do, mm. you know, with the sexual abuse and then um, the child trafficking, how are you accepted? Because as you say, you're a foreigner. Yes. You're a woman of color as well. Mm -hmm. You know, how are you accepted? By the grace of God, the places where I go, I do my best to immerse the culture. So when I'm in India, 
I will eat, dress, and act like them, and I will do everything in my power to really embrace that culture. I'm a born-again Christian, so I'm not going to compromise my faith, but I want to meet people where they're at. So when I'm in India, I'm sleeping on the floor, eating with my right hand, sitting on the ground, whatever I can do to meet them where they are, because I'm not better than anyone else. And I'm there to help. And I feel by understanding about dowry murder, honor killings, incest, by understanding it, you can bring change. But these are dangerous areas you're going to, especially in these countries. Yes. In those countries. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I'm very fortunate that I spend a lot of time with on-the-ground NGOs, non-government organizations. Okay. And okay. then when I do go to the red light district, I don't go off with anybody. I sit there and observe. So I spend a lot of time observing. And in places like the Philippines, I build up a relationship with these individuals. I spend time with them. Those I the talk victim, to them. The victims of, um, of trafficking. Trafficking. Not necessarily trafficking, but those who are in sexual exploitation, exploitation. Okay. because they have pimps, but not all of them have pimps. Right. And it's interesting, I've actually met pimps in the Philippines who were female, 60 and 70 years of age. I met a pimp in Cambodia who was around 30 years of age, very attractive woman. I didn't realize she was a pimp. But then she was fully dressed. And then when I went home, I realized, wait a minute, she was so covered up, she was the pimp. But I didn't realize at the time. So I was praying with her and talking to her and loving her, which is the thing we should do as mm -hmm. Christians. And then I was like, wait a minute, she's a pimp. And that kind of bothered me. But then I'm like, you know what? I did what Jesus would do. do. I loved her. I didn't judge her. I accepted her. Because she's a human being, just like I said earlier. She's a person. And often, these women who become pimps, they have aged out of prostitution. Do you work with Africans as well? I haven't had the opportunity yet to get immersed in the culture right here. I've spoken to schools here. I've spoken to some children in the orphanage. And I've educated them on this issue. And the children have disclosed to me about sexual abuse. So I know it's happening here. I've heard it from males and females who are telling me about ancestral relationships taking place right in Ghana. Yeah. And do you intend to do something about it? I would like to, and I'm trying to build connections with people who can assist them. I believe therapy and counseling is important, so I'm connected to a therapist who will provide pro bono assistance to those who cannot afford it. And then, of course, I want to get myself in amongst those who are in positions of power, the police, the government, so that if there is a security risk, if there's an issue that is immediate, that needs intervention, mm. I have somebody's number on speed dial. Mm. But you, you don't have any links here. Not you, yet. You, you, not yet. Mm. Ah, I like that. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> I mean, you intend to do that. You told, you told me about you, your mum and your um, stepdad now. The second one. The second. The, 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 yes. Yeah. Why are you stressing on that being the, the, the second, second one? Because my because mom... the first one... <laughs> He's a pedophile, number one, and he's deceased. Okay. So this is the second stepfather, my mm. mother's new husband. Yeah. He's Jamaican. He's a raster. So they've been coming to, to, to uh, Ghana for years. They've been mm. coming here for years. But he's the second husband. He's not my father, and he's not a pedophile, as far as I'm aware. Where? Because no, I I'm can't swear for anyone. Exactly. <laughs> but where's your dad, your father? My biological father is in London, England. Okay. He's actually a lawyer also, and he's back home. My father's a lawyer, and he spends a lot of time helping others, but getting paid to do ah, it. Ah, so you oh, okay. <laughs> okay, you, you'll be your, your father's daughter, but he's getting paid. What does he think about you going off like that to these countries where you virtually know nobody, mm -hmm. you're going to volunteer, and you don't get paid? He wants me to become an... And I guess he supports you financially. <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> My dad has around 10 children. He has a lot of children who are a lot older than I am. And okay. unfortunately, he doesn't support financially. He doesn't even know I'm in Ghana, which is terrible. We don't really communicate very much. But my father would like me to get a job in England as an English lawyer. But I'm not qualified as an English lawyer. I'm a New York lawyer. So he wants me to be an English lawyer. I'm not going to do it. So that's it. <laughs> that's kind of the long and short. So Juanita, <laughs> is this for you? Is, this, is, is that it for you to, to, to work with the vulnerable. Mm. In other, is that it for you, or you intend to settle down in a particular country to practice your law a full time, settle down with a family and? What is it for you? For me, I have three dreams. The first one is to get a paid job one day. That is dream number one. Yeah, okay. Dream number two, I want to build an orphanage in the Philippines. And when I say orphanage, I just want to provide homes. For the last six years, I've been volunteering full time unpaid. I live almost like a missionary. So I understand homelessness like no other. I really want to provide homes for people. And then the third thing I want to do, I want to build a bakery with open hiring policy. So what is open hiring policy? I want to hire people who are homeless, but of mm. sane mind. 
I want to hire men and women who've left the sex industry and I want to hire ex-convicts. Mm. In the United States, Ben and Jerry's ice cream have a brownie factory. Every employee in the brownie factory is an ex-convict. I had my dream before Ben and Jerry's. Those are my dreams. I would love to be a paid lawyer. I would love to go into court and wave around weapons and be all mm. sensational like you see in the movies. Mm. I would love to do that, but right now it's just not possible. Without having a green card or a visa, I'm simply stuck with providing advice to clients over the table, which is amazing and helpful. But unfortunately, the NGOs I volunteer with don't have the funding to go to court. Right. Client consultation is important, but I wish I could go one step further. Mm -hmm. And for me, settle down. I don't know if that will ever happen, but I would love to spend time being stable, which mm -hmm. is what money will bring. And so for me, the new book, Can You Keep a Secret, that will be coming out very soon, I will be giving away 60% of profit mm. to charity, 60% mm. I'll give away, the 40% remaining will be my income. I and I believe I'll be spending a lot of time in Trinidad and Tobago where I go mm. every year. Okay. That may be my kind of roots where I'll settle down. Mm. I believe I'll be moving there. I think I've met my future husband there. So <laughs> he doesn't know that I know, but yeah, I believe. <laughs> I believe I've met my husband in Trinidad. Has, has he made a movie yet? He doesn't know I know, and he, I don't know if he knows I know. <laughs> so there's a guy Are you who, your friends? Yes, we're friends, okay. and I want to marry him and things, but he doesn't really know if I know. And if, <laughs> you get there. So you yeah, get there. that's the plan. It's in God's hands. I believe that. It's, it's in God's hands. So I believe that. What was I going to? Um, you said to her, your new book. Yes. So... Do you have a book already? Have you yeah, my book is actually in the process of being printed right here in Ghana. And Lord willing, I'll be able to do a book signing before I leave the country. My desire is to get the book into the hands of the general public. Mm. The book is called Can You Keep a Secret? Secret yeah. Because that is the so most important question. So that's going to question. be your first book. Yeah, And I'm already ever. intrigued by the title. Can <laughs> you keep a secret? <laughs> it's can important. Secret? Yeah. It's the most important thing I can teach anybody. And every time I present... Every time I'm on the radio or TV, I've had a TV interview of five minutes and I mentioned, can you keep a secret? For me, it's the tagline. If we all change our responses to yes, mm. I believe a lot will change. I believe children will be disclosing what's going on at home. Do you think it's about time we teach, we give girls, young girls and young boys, the power to be able to fight perpetrators? Definitely, absolutely. I feel that we need to be empowered to have a voice. A lot of times we talk about giving a voice to the voiceless, but often we as parents and caregivers, I'm not a parent, but often we do not give that voice because we have so many rules in place and because we are so restrictive and sometimes very narrow in our thinking. I find children are a lot more receptive to learning compared to adults. As adults, we become stuck in our ways. If we want to protect children, we've got to empower them. We've got to have uncomfortable conversations. We need to talk about sex and abuse and trafficking. I talk to boys about pornography all the time and they give me too much details, but the point is they can talk to me. And as a Christian, I don't agree with porn, but I'm not going to judge them. If they're Christian, I'll talk from a Christian perspective. If they're Muslim, I'll use that. And at the end of the day, pornography is harmful. And my book talks about all of these things because the desire is to get us to change the way we think. We're all human beings. Catholics are not pedophiles. People are pedophiles. And we've got to change our responses so we can protect one another. That's mm. important. Mm. And how can parents know without the children even coming to them, mm. know that my child is in danger? Often, or being abused. It's through certain identifiers and signs. So with small children, they may have aggressive behavior, suck in the thumb or wet in the bed. With children who are older than that, maybe depression, low self-esteem, insomnia, PTSD, obesity. What about somebody uncomfortable getting undressed in front of another? Right. What about a person who's promiscuous in their behavior? Often when we see promiscuity, we judge it, but we have no place to. I believe when we see something, we should always go back to why, mentally. When a girl or boy is promiscuous, why? When a girl or boy has insomnia, why? When a girl or boy is uncomfortable with their body, why? Because for me, I have many of those identifiers. My friends, when they hang around with me long enough, they will see that I have insomnia and low self-esteem and uncomfortable getting undressed in front of females. If they ask themselves why, it's obvious. And what we have to understand is that a person who was abused 20 years ago may still exhibit those signs and identifiers as an adult. And on the back of that, why is it that most adults do not disclose they've been abused until they're adults? Why don't they say anything when they're 10 or 15, but when they're 50, we read about it in the papers?
when you they're know, 14. That's, that's something you, you said that really pricked my conscience. That's why I've extended a 10 minute interview to almost um, 30 or 40 minutes now because it's quite intriguing. Mm. Why is it that they're not able to talk about it? until they are older? There must be a problem. So there must be something that we are doing, adults are doing wrong. Yes. That is not allowing them. You know, I, I find myself in the same situation. I've had people who've told me they're HIV positive and I'm the only person they've told. Yes. They have been told their parents. Yes. I've had people who have told me that they are lesbians or, you know, homosexuals and I'm the first person they've told and only person because they can trust me to keep it even if I talk about it, not to mention their names. Yes. I've had people who've been abused sexually and I'm the only person. And you just, why can't they talk to their own parents about it? I want to ask you a question. Can ask you me. keep a secret? I can keep That's it. That's why. That is the reason. Because honestly, fear is one of the greatest things. People talk about fear, which is false evidence appearing real. We're afraid. False evidence appearing real. We're afraid. Yeah. Mm, but mm. they trust you. And when they trust you, they can open up. Because number one, you will not judge them. When I was abused at four, I couldn't talk about it because it's embarrassing and uncomfortable. And then people say, why didn't you scream? Realistically speaking, a lot of us, not all, a lot of us who are abused, we're groomed. When someone grooms you, you won't scream because all of a sudden, you're abused. Yeah. You didn't realize it because it was gradual. It started with just a hug. And then from the hug, it progressed. In my instance, it started with tickling. And then my stepfather's hand slipped. It started with tickling. So I'm very against tickling because that's how it slipped began. deliberately. Intentionally slipped. And then what went wrong is my mom told me when I confided in her, don't let it happen again. So when it happened again, I didn't tell her. Because she told me nobody should touch your body parts. And that's an important thing for us to teach our kids. But it's not enough, in my opinion. Because when you're groomed, it happens like that. You don't realize. Even adults get groomed. Even adults get groomed and they should know better. So why are we putting the responsibility on the child? And I find that frustrating because people ask me, why didn't you scream? He was coming in my room. I was sleeping. And then I'd wake up and then he's trying to rape me. You understand? How would I scream? Yeah. Like, and the thing with we me... We tend to blame the victim yes. instead of the perpetrator. Yes. And in my instance, I was groomed in the daytime. So in the morning, my stepfather would give me candy. He'd let me stay up late. He'd give me alcohol pumps, which is like a soft drink with alcohol. Mm -hmm. Then in my sleep, he'd abuse me. So I separated that because I was abused in my sleep. But in the daytime, he was nice. He never discussed the abuse. It was totally separate. So when people say, oh, maybe he threatened you, everyone's story is different. Friend. Everyone's story is different. different. And he was my best friend. He was my best friend, and people don't get that. He was my stepfather. He taught me to ride a bike. He taught me to cook. He let me stay up late. My mom is strict. It, he just played one off the other, and it worked. And it, it worked. worked. However, I didn't want it to continue, so I was trying to disclose with Can You Keep a Secret? And the response is why I kept quiet for all those years. And even as a child, I couldn't talk about it. As an adult, I say it freely, but it took years before I could easily just talk about what I went through. I'm a beneficiary of the Girl in Need Foundation. Some time ago, there was no hope for me to go to school. But through the Girl in Need Foundation, I was able to complete my secondary education. I quite remember when we completed JHS, things became very, very tough. But with the help of God and the help of this foundation, which is the Girl in Need Child Foundation, now we are who we are today. And this foundation are really, has really, really helped me. So I'm pleading with you that you help with any amount you have. Please give something out. Donate at least one city for a girl. who will change one one's life. Remember, your one city can touch a life out there, can make impact in the life of somebody. Tough one, right? Really tough one. So can you keep a secret? 
Well, let me say thank you to GTP for my cloth. My dress was made for me by Ophelia Crossland Designs. Beads by Sun Beads and All. Sun Beads and All. My hair by Inshilo. Makeup products by Paba Cosmetics applied by Makeup and More. Now, let's listen to her. Juanita, I can keep a secret. I know you can. Now, let me ask you. I know you're a Christian. Yes. Are you sure you've healed? I would say, because there's life and death in the power of the tongue, healed in Jesus' name, but used to have. I say used to have, meaning like last night I got no sleep because of the insomnia. Used to have uncomfortability being undressed in front of females. That was like yesterday. So I believe I'm healed, but... You're still hurting. Yes. It's deep down somewhere. It's there. Yeah. And then the thing is, often when you've been abused, there's a lot of dysfunctions and people don't realize that. Maybe you're very controlling. Maybe you've got a lot of anger. Maybe you're very aggressive. And so for me, there's a lot of anger. And so when I WhatsApp my friends, there's anger. I'm not angry at them. It's just like you're angry at the world. And so every communication is angry. Even when I'm not angry, people think I'm angry. I don't know why it is, but it's almost as though we don't know how to deal with our emotions. And so that is the default. Anger is the default. And I trust a lot. I'm very, very trusting. Not paranoid, as I said. Lots of male friends. But I don't think like that. I don't allow myself to go to, have they done something? Because then I wouldn't hang out with anybody because women do it too. Because, you know, when you walked in, I nearly misunderstood you when you came to the office today. And I'm glad that you've opened up and mm. you've educated me. That's great. That you should understand people, where they are coming from, why they behave in a certain yes, way. Yes, yes. Especially when you don't know anything about them. Yes, yes. That's what I want people to do. I now, want us to stop judging. Can you trust me to do something? Can I give you a hug? <laughs> sure. Okay. Now, let me give you a big <laughs> fat hug. Mm. I'm so glad I'm talking to you. I'm so glad. Thank you, thank you for trusting me to give you a hug. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the hug. Now, let me ask you. Now, for a child watching you who's been abused, doesn't have any access to you, what have you got to say to that child? To a parent watching you who knows that her or his child is being abused, but has decided to keep a blind eye because of what people say, because of the stigma, because of the fear. Mm -hmm. What have you got to tell such a person? It's really important to say something. And in the US, we have all these posters. If you see something, say something. We need to help each other. We need to be our brother's keeper and understand that it's very embarrassing and it's very difficult for you to accept that your spouse or partner or family member has sexually abused somebody. But by you keeping it quiet, you're allowing that child to believe that what they went through, that's normal. Sometimes when a child has been abused at a young age and no one does anything, they think, well, that's what, what happens then, right? And so they end up in a pattern of being abused repeatedly, systematically, sometimes ending up in prostitution, sometimes becoming promiscuous. And it started because no one did anything. It becomes a learning behavior. And even though you're thinking, oh, well, people will judge us, isn't it better to protect your children? Because at the end of the day, those children are going to grow up and have their own. And we don't want to have a vicious cycle. We need to understand that abuse and trafficking is not new. Yeah. In the Bible, the first trafficking story was Joseph. Yeah. And we had incest in the Bible. But at the end of the day, we have a good God and a just God, but he gives us the responsibility to do our part. Sometimes we sit and spiritualize things and pray about everything, but we need to act. And at the end of the day, nobody should be violated. We shouldn't sit by and allow a family member, someone close, be violated because you're embarrassed about it. And then with the children, it's hard to talk about it, but you've got to tell somebody. somebody. You've got to tell somebody. And can you keep a secret doesn't work because mm. people are going to say it depends. So you've got to tell someone. Mm -hmm. And it is hard, but maybe write it down. Because to me, I couldn't verbalize it. But if I had paper and pen and I had thought about it, I could write it down. That's a lot easier than vocalizing it. It's right. a lot easier. Right. So if I was a child, let's say in this day and age, we have now technology, yeah. I would WhatsApp it. Yeah. Because it's easier. And even disclosing abuse, when the child discloses, you can't get angry. You mm. can't point the finger and blame them. You have to accept that the person who abused is the perpetrator and the child is not responsible. 
And we have to be realistic. Sometimes children abuse each other. Yeah. We have children yes, who are abusing one another. We just had a case another. here in Ghana yes. where a boy was abused by, you know, age group of boys. Six of them in school. So, yeah, it does happen. Exactly. And we have five-year-olds, even here in Ghana, four-year-olds sexually abusing their peers with three. But, but the question is, where is the three-year-old learning it from? from. We, and even, like, culturally, in Asia, even here and in the Caribbean, even in the West, we might see little children pull down their skirt or their pants. When we see that, we people, we laugh. Yeah. I don't laugh. Because my question is, who else are they entertaining? Yeah. Because I know for me, and maybe everyone here today, our parents taught us how to dress and undress in private. Yeah. So when a child is doing that, why are we laughing? For me, ask the question, why? With every kind of behavior. Last night, I didn't sleep well. My friends were like, oh, are you stressed? No. Why? Because I was abused many years ago. I've had insomnia all my life. It's not stress. Ask why. You know what I mean? Why, why, why? Thank you, Juanita. Thank you so much for opening up and, you know, educating me mm. and, you know, empowering me and giving me this information. Always ask why. Yes. Because as a mother as well, you know, I, I get paranoid and I get it, but you've given me other tools. That's great. That I can use as well. Now, how can we contact you on social media? I have a Facebook page, which is Changing Cases, and then my yeah. website is changingcases.org. So that's C H A N G I N G. Cases, C A S E S dot org. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll write it on the screen as well so people can contact Brilliant. you. Brilliant. And wish you all the best. And Thank I, you. I hope to see you again. <laughs> I hope so. I hope to see you again. <laughs> Thank where we you. Can do something where you can have, you know, examples and, you know, maybe we can bring together people who have suffered yes. in abuse and you can talk to them as well That'd and be share amazing. with them. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for having me. I'm so grateful. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So that's her story. That is her story. Using her experience to help others. Again, I say thank you to House of Food, Cake Technique, Awake Purified Mineral Water, Casa Preco Royal Drinks, Yuck Cleaning Services, Cake Technique, and all those who support us. Daddy Cool, uh, you know, pastries. You know, we are grateful to all of them. Now, I'll be back shortly with a bit of me. Hello, beautiful people. I know you're all wondering why you're seeing two different people on the standpoint today. Yes, tonight we own the show. Me, myself, and King, but he wants me to call him Bliss. Tonight we are going to host Ohene Yuri, Gifty Auntie. How different, how? how different is being married to a royal? So does it affect you your Christian faith? How did you know? What was that moment you realized this is the man I will spend the rest of my life with? At this point, do you have a count on how many countries you have been to? So during those times, were you in a relationship? Did it affect your work? Mm -hmm. People say women in the media are not fortunate mm -hmm. when it comes to relationship. Mm -hmm. And is it true that it affected you? Another comment says, what do you regret most in life? Same so Jack or JJ? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> now let me ask you, can you keep a secret? Mommy, can you keep a secret? Daddy, can you keep a secret? Grandma, auntie, brother, can you keep a secret? What would be your answer if your young one comes to you with such a question? Can you keep the secret? Our young ones are suffering. They are going through things that they are not able to open up to us and tell us. I tell people that I get amazed. The things that people come, young people come and confide in me about, and yet they can't tell their own parents. I've had people come to tell me they are lesbians. They are homosexuals. They are HIV positive. They've been abused. They've been raped. Yet nobody in their family knows about it. Why is that? I don't take pride in being the only one. I wish they could talk to their parents about it. I wish they can open up to their parents about it. What are we doing so wrong as parents that is making it difficult for our young ones to be able to open up to us? How are we empowering them? Things are happening. I've said this before and I'm saying it again. 
listen, anybody can be a perpetrator and anybody can be a victim of sexual abuse. Anybody's child can be a victim. So let's open our eyes. Let's look out for our young ones. Let's have time for them. Let's give them a listening ear. Let's end their trust in us. Because <laughs> being abused, no matter who you are, no matter what you become, it has a way of affecting you. It has a way of telling on you. It has a way of changing your life. And not just you, but people around you. So please, next time you see somebody behaving in a certain way, that to you is not normal. Take your time. Find out why. They easily get angry. Find out why. They get mood swings. Find out why. They are promiscuous. Find out why. I know I've said that no reason is good enough. And we all have choices. But sometimes when people don't get help early enough, they don't get help early enough. It totally messes up their lives. So again, I ask you, can you keep a secret? Can your child come and confide in you? Can they come and talk to you freely, knowing that you've got their back and that you not tell them that it's their fault, that you not want that they shouldn't do that again without finding out what exactly happened? Can you keep a secret? I remain a woman with super crazy faith in God. I know he's got me covered. I know he's got my family covered. But he has given me wisdom. He says I should be wise as a serpent. He says I should open my eyes. He says he's giving me charge over my children. So can you keep a secret? The secret I want you to keep is that look out for your child. In your child's trust. Have a conversation with your child. And when I say your child, not just your biological ch child or children, but anybody around you who needs you. Thanks for watching. See you same time next week. Bye for now.